Cafe latte, cheesecake. I don't know yet. Uh, it's it's a package about this big, and it's there. Uh, open me, open me. I bet it's a grill. I don't know. I don't know what it is. A what? A grill. I, I feel like a lot. Of I got a grill last. Their dad's a grill. Oh, a chair. It's not that big. It's this big. Not it. Well, that big. Well, that's it's, what we and it is my dad. So I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, I have three goals. One is to cover some content with Jefferson as president. One is to address the first and last paragraphs of your Lexington paper. I think after today, you'll feel better about uh, that. And then finally, revisit the debate teams that you're in, uh, allow you time to uh, think about your team's approach. Plus, there were a number of people not here, and we got to figure out where you belong. Okay. Oh, did you? Did you, you? Did you been Yeah, I tried to try to get the happy start? birthday in it, but it's too late. When was the first presidential election? Not 1800. Actually, yes. Close. 1789. 1789 and presidential terms are four years and that means that there is an election every four years and the last election was 2016 and elections are every four years so how could the first election have been in 1789 when math dictates that if terms are every four years and the last one was in 2016, that would mean that every election would have to be in an even year. So how is the first one uh, violating math? Yes? No. Very good guess though. Yes? No, but another very good guess. There were no term limits, but that doesn't matter. There's still an election every four years. Any other guesses? Yes. Nope. Incorrect. Yes. We didn't. Yes. No. No. None of those things matter. Uh, our, our, our country has fixed elections. There are other countries where... Uh, elections are based on um, the, the desire of the government to work uh, and accomplish things. And as soon as that proves to be feeble, the government says, all right, I guess we need an election. Uh, but our elections are fixed. And if you are in civics or have taken civics or will be taking civics, um, we have two unique features. One, we have a bi-party system, a two-party system, and we have fixed election cycles. And those things make uh, our country sort of yunnick. But the answer is this. Um, so let, let, I, I think you can figure out the answer. So our last election was 2016, right? November of 2016. When did Trump become president? January of 2017. So that means that means from November 2016 until Trump was sworn in, which is about two months or so, Obama was still president. What did Trump do during that two months? Prepared. That's right. He prepared. You're exactly right. He named the people that he would be, uh, uh, if, if uh, approved, the new secretary of state and the new secretary of the treasury and this and that. Uh, the other thing, there was a transition period. Oh, did you hear what I just said? There's a transition period where Obama sort of slowly withdraws and Trump sort of slowly steps in. Is there a point? No one sees it. Is no there a point where there's ever not a president like in between Obama and Trump? Like 
No, uh, theoretically, like the moment is. the moment <laughs> Trump utters the last word of the oath, he becomes president. And until that moment, Obama was president. Oh, so there is no. So there's like no. Theoretically, there's never a moment when there's not a president. Oh, okay. That's correct. Okay. No one, no one saw it. Um, we need a transition so the old president can step out and the new president can step in. Very good. The, the very good. The first president, there is no previous president to transition out. The moment after he was elected, he was president. The first president, George Washington, is the only president to become president the same year he was elected because the election and then he was president. That was it. Sure. Uh, back then, the, the swearing in was slightly different, but I mean, it was the day after. The day after the election, he was president. That was it. Uh, unlike all of the rest of the elections where the election takes place and then there's that transition period, okay? So let's fat, that means first one was 1789. The next one would be 1792. The third one would be 1796. The fourth one would be 1800, which is this one. This is the election of 1800. Georgie Porgy runs twice, wins twice, unopposed. No one's going to run against George Washington. You'll lose. Everyone knew that. So he runs unopposed. The third election then would be the first, because George decided, I'm not running anymore. And he establishes a precedent. Two-term presidency. Have we ever had a president more than that? No, yeah. Yes, FDR. one. FDR. Oh, yeah. FDR. So understand that he didn't have to stop being uh, president. And he probably would have won a third term and a fourth term. But remember, this is during the time when Napoleon is doing his thing, kind of around this time. And, and uh, Georgie, uh, one of the things that we have to give George credit for is stopping the rule of George, stepping back and saying it's bigger than me. Um, this is a country that is, that is um, uh, on the line here, not me. So he steps back and he retires. The second president is John Adams. This is the third election, which in my opinion is the most messed up election in our nation's history. It is seriously crazy mofo stuff. So you'll notice that there are two parties, the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists. Pray tell which one is liberal, which one likes government, big government. The Federalists are the liberal party. Hooray for central government. The Democratic Republicans are the conservative states' rights party. Thomas Jefferson was the vice president because in 1796... If you won the election, you were president. If you came in second, you were the vice president. Imagine if that were true today. We'd have President Trump and Vice President Hillary Clinton. So between the previous election and this one, they altered the Constitution. They created an amendment. I think it's the 11th Amendment. No, it's the 12th Amendment. It's the 12th Amendment, which said, okay, that's dumb. Uh, having the second place person be vice president, you should have a team. And so what, that's in essence what the 12th Amendment said, that they'll run as teams. So two people will run from one party and two people will run from the other party. And so it's Jefferson and his, and the other person, Aaron Burr. No. Okay, hold on now, hold on. Okay, so you are aware that Aaron had a Oopsie. kind of a crazy moment, all right? <laughs> His opponent is John Adams, the incumbent. Big word there, incumbent. What does that mean? What does incumbent mean? <laughs> John Adams was the incumbent. Country of origin? <laughs> yes, country of origin. You know, when I was in fifth grade and we did the spelling, uh, uh, we were supposed to do that. And the teacher said, I, I don't remember what the word was. Let's just say it's incumbent. And the teacher said, use it in a sentence. And I said, okay, I don't know what incumbent means. <laughs> That's a sentence. She didn't like that. Okay. Uh, uh, incumbent means person holding the office and running for re-election. 
John Adams was the person who was president and was trying to get re-elected. That's what incumbent means. Person currently holding the office. His challenger is Thomas Jefferson. Everyone understand? Okay. Now, raise your hand as soon as you see the flaw. No one sees it yet. Well, I, I don't, I, I'm giving you credit. You haven't seen the flaw. That's perfectly understandable. Okay. So Jefferson and Burr win the electoral vote. There's the electoral vote. Jefferson and Burr. That's right. Jefferson and Burr. The ticket. Jefferson and Burr win the electoral vote. The Jefferson Burr ticket wins the electoral vote. John Adams lost. He pushed it. Oh, he was the he was elected previously, 1796. He's wait, running wait, wait. now for wait. re-election. You said the first two were George Washington. Yep. The second one was the first two was George Washington, 89, 92. Yes. John Adams was now elected in 96. He is now running for re-election four years later. Who's this, who's this guy? I don't know. Well, I think his name was Pinckney. He was the guy that wrote that treaty. Pinckney. Anyone see the fly yet? What? Between who? That's right. Who's the president? Is it President Jefferson or President Burr? It didn't clear, clarify that. It just said you're running as a team. And Jefferson and Burr you know, they ran as a team. And of course, Jefferson said, well, it's me. I, I'm the president. Right, Aaron? Right, Aaron Burr? And Burr's like, nope. I want to be president. There was a tie in the Electoral College, not between Jefferson and Adams, but between Jefferson and Burr. So there was a tie. They didn't remake so the vice president. They, just they did not clarify in the 12th Amendment which one would be president and which one would be vice president. It just said you're running as a team. It did not clarify which one was which. And so Jefferson tied Burr, which is messed up. It would be like today, Trump tying Pence. President Trump, vice president Pence, right? It, it'd be like, well, we don't know which one's which. And anytime an election does not yield a winner, what happens? It goes to the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives at the time was controlled by the Federalist Party. Oh, no. So the Federalists get to decide which Democratic Republican they hate less, which is true. And it took them something like 30 votes before, because it was a tie. It was a tie. It was a tie. It was a tie. And then finally, this is kind of interesting now, guess who said, all right, let's vote for Jefferson. Bird, Bird is not in the House of Representatives. <coughs> Alexander <laughs> Hamilton. Alexander oh. Hamilton, opponent of Thomas Jefferson, hated Burr more. Ooh. Now, he oh, was not oh. in the House of Representatives. This gets good. This gets good. <laughs> he was not in the House of Representatives, but he had pull. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, so guess who Burr blames for losing the presidential election. Alexander. Alexander Hamilton. So he challenges him to a duel. <laughs> now, back then, duels were a thing. They were illegal, but they were still a thing, right? And if you say, well, you can't do that, it's illegal. I'm sure no one in here speeds. No one in here drives in excess of the speed limit because it's illegal. Yeah. No cheaters in here. Anyway, there was a duel. Now, back then, a duel went, okay, you chose your pistol, you walked 10 paces, you turn around, you fired into the ground there. All right, then you, okay, so Alexander Hamilton takes 10 paces, turns around, fires it into the ground. Aaron Burr takes 10 paces, turns around, aims, and shoots him in the chest. And he dies. Alexander Hamilton dies because of a stupid duel to Aaron Burr, who, by the way, fled the country because he just murdered someone, moved to Europe, made an alliance with the French, a guy named Napoleon, 
Napoleon's plan later on was to reconquer this chunk of land right here called Louisiana and name Aaron Burr the ruler of Louisiana. And it didn't happen because Napoleon lost the Battle of Haiti. And so Aaron Burr went away. But why haven't they made a movie out of that? Uh, good, good, good question. Okay. Uh, issues at the time. The Alien and Sedition Acts were constantly brought up by the Democratic Republicans. Vote for me, said Jefferson and Burr. Uh, I will help kill these two laws. And it, it did prove to be an issue that resonated with voters. At the same time, Jefferson was also a bit unpopular. And this is what, this is what John Adams kept pointing out. You can't vote for Jefferson. He doesn't even believe in God. He's not a Christian, right? Uh, Jefferson was largely responsible for the elimination of the, any, any official church in Virginia. Um, so he strongly advocated the complete separation between church and government, or church and state. And this was used against him by uh, uh, John Adams, but wasn't as strong uh, a, a sway. You can see that Jefferson wins popular votes and electoral votes up and down the coast. Northerners voted for him. Southerners voted for him. Most of the Federalist liberal support comes from the Northeast. And I will point out that this continues to be true today. Bold prediction here. Here we go. Bold prediction. In 2020, in 2020 when Trump runs for re-election, they will show a map of the United States. And if you only look at the map, it will look like Trump dominated. It'll all be Trump, whatever color that is. Red. It'll all be red. And then a few things over here will be blue. And a few things on the coast over here will be blue. But if you base it on the map, you'll think, well, Trump won. But I also I'm making a bold prediction. The entire map will look like Trump won. Prediction number two, the Democratic nominee will win the coasts. And prediction number three, it will be extremely close. Very, very close. Because I'm about to make some generalizations here. Rural people... People in rural areas tend to vote conservatively. They don't see the benefit of government. They live kind of off the grid. They live independently. They don't see the massive government services because they don't live in cities where there are massive government services, whether it's police or roads or schools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The coasts are where most people live. Most people live in cities along the coasts, right? California is the most populous state. There are big cities over there in California, like Los Angeles. And there are big cities over here, like New York. The Democratic nominee will win every major city, every one. And the Republican nominee will win the states where nobody lives. Nobody lives in Wyoming. And the Republican nominee, Trump, will win Wyoming. Nobody lives in the Dakotas. Why do we have two of them? <laughs> but the Republican nominee, Trump, will win because rural people tend to vote conservative, and currently that's Republican. People that live in cities tend to vote liberal because they see the benefit of government services. And whoever the Democratic nominee will be will win every major city. And if the city population outnumbers the rural population, then the Democratic nominee will win that state. That's why states like Ohio and Illinois are always kind of iffy, because if you take the population of Illinois and you split it into two things, Chicago and the rest, the Democratic nominee will win Chicago and Trump will win the rest. Because the state of Illinois has a population, about half live in Chicago, and the other half live everywhere else. Same as Wisconsin, same as Minnesota. The Democratic nominee will win the Twin Cities, and Trump will win the rural north and the rural south. It's, it's just the way people tend to vote. Okay. Uh, any questions on this one? Let's keep rocking. Sorry, question? 
Like it's, it's the same. Uh, we are generally a rural area <laughs> here in Western Wisconsin. Trump wins. Trump dominated this area in the last election. Where did uh, Hillary Clinton do well? Milwaukee and Madison. I keep getting texts about it. I'm not sure about Green Bay. I'm not, I'm not sure about it. At the election. It's like okay. one Wisconsin. So what did gray. I'm like, Jefferson okay. do as wait. president? Now, don't look at this yet. I, I'll hide it. Whoa. What was Jefferson? Conservative or liberal? Conservative. He was conservative. So if you were to boldly predict what President Jefferson would do with the Bank of the United States, he's the president now. What do you predict he would do with it? You think he'd get rid of it. What about the Alien Act and the Sedition Act? What about the size of the military? What would a conservative president do with these things that, as President John Adams, supported uh, because he was a Federalist? Just think in your own heads. What would a conservative do with these expansion of central government ideas like the Alien Act, the Sedition Act, the Bank of the United States? Okay, now let's see if it holds true. President Jefferson kept the Bank of the United States. Does that make sense? No. It doesn't make sense. But he did it anyway. He did it anyway. He did it even though it violated his own understanding of this document called the Constitution. He did it anyway, which should start leading you to a conclusion about Thomas Jefferson. Was Thomas Jefferson a hardcore conservative? He wasn't. Does anyone know the term for identifying politicians who are not in the extreme? Uh, no. Good guess, though. Moderate or centrist. Very good. Moderate or centrist. He was a centrist. I mean, think about this. Under his presidency, the United States purchased the Louisiana Territory. Now, where in the Constitution does it say the president has the authority to do that? It doesn't! And so clearly, Jefferson, as a strict constructionist, would conclude he did not have the authority to buy the Louisiana Territory. And so he said, I'd love to buy it from you, Napoleon, but I can't. Right? Nope. Then why did he do it? Why did he keep the Bank of the U.S.? Why did he buy Louisiana? It violates his own principles. Why did he do it? Because it's a bargain! I mean, I, I think Louisiana Territory was sold for about a penny per acre. Per acre. It, it was a bargain. Right? Now, back then, they didn't really know what they were buying. Why did he keep the Bank of the U.S.? Because it was working. The U.S. was getting out of debt. I don't agree with it, but I'm going to keep it. It's working, even though I hate it. I'm going to keep it. He kept the tariff. Does this make sense? It doesn't, but it was working. He is a moderate. He is not a hardcore conservative. It was working. It was making the U.S. money to get us out of debt. He kept the, the military affairs. He kept the idea that the United States government would assume all state debts. It violates his understanding of the role of the U.S. government, but he does it anyway. A couple other things. He got rid of the whiskey tax. He did, presidents don't get rid of whiskey taxes. He allowed it to expire. No, he repealed. He had it repealed. Yep. The Democratic Republicans controlled Congress. They repealed it. They actively removed it. And then the other two things, the Alien and Sedition Acts, were simply allowed to expire. So you will notice, you will notice something about the Alien and Sedition Acts. Did the United States government determine that the Alien and Sedition Acts were unconstitutional? No. no, they never settled that question. They simply went away. So we still don't know whether or not states can nullify federal laws. We don't know the answer. It will come up again and again and again and again. What do you think? about the idea that states can nullify federal laws. Can't wait to read about it. Okay. One slide left. One slide left. Okay. So John Adams is, pre we're going back to John Adams' presidency. Who names judges 
to the federal level judiciary. Who does that? The president does. On the last day of his presidency, John Adams had a bunch of names written on a piece of paper. And he gave it to his secretary of state. That's a guy named Marbury. Marbury worked for John Adams. Here, give this list to the new president. Marbury then gave it to Mr. Madison. Madison was going to be the next secretary of state. So in essence, it's John Adams giving this list to Thomas Jefferson, but it's Adams proxy, Marbury, giving it to Jefferson's proxy, Madison. You follow me? This might as well say Adams, and this might as well say Jefferson. Adams gave a list to Jefferson. Here, I want these people to be named judges. I'm still the president. It's my power to name people judges. I want these people to be judges here. And Madison, acting on behalf of Jefferson, says, I'm not touching that piece of paper. I'm not taking it. But you have to. I'm still the president. My boss is still the president. The Constitution says that the president gets to name judges. Adams is still the president. Here's his wish list. Here. I'm not taking it. Okay. So we have one question. I have a question for you. The question is, can the next president refuse to accept a list of people that should be named judges by the current president? It is the current president. Can he say, I'm not accepting that list? Wait, why can't he do it now? Uh, they have to be confirmed. The Senate, right? You know that Judge Kavanaugh, who was just approved to the Supreme Court, Trump named him as a nominee for the Supreme Court, and then they went through that awful confirmation process, whether you think Kavanaugh was perfectly deserving or you think he behaved in certain behaviors when he was younger, I think we'll all agree that was kind of an ugly episode, those of you who pay attention to this sort of So they have to be confirmed, okay? You understand? So far you understand. So the first question is, does the next president have to honor the wishes of the, pre the, cur the current president? But there's a more important question. And I'm wondering if any of you can figure it out. I've, I've got an idea. All right, let's pretend. Uh, let's pretend it's a basketball game, and and our, our our boys. Who's the who's the team to beat this year? Besides Somerset, of course. No. Prescott's always good. New right. Richmond's kind of the team to beat. All right. So let's say that uh, um, uh, New Richmond is is New Richmond playing here this year. You play them twice, don't you? It's both. Okay. So let's just say it's here. So our Somerset boys are playing New Richmond uh, boys in boys basketball, and the refs don't show up. There are no refs, and and um, there's a there's a play where um, uh, let's say Benny here is shooting free throws, and one of the New Richmond players, you're aware that when you're shooting free throws, you have to stay out of that middle lane, but one of the New Richmond players just decides to just step right in the middle of the lane, right in front of the basket, and. Then he misses, and he goes up for the rebound. And by the way, it's going to go in, but he jumps and grabs the ball out of the cylinder and withdraws it. That's pretty amazing, but he does. He grabs it out of the cylinder and withdraws it and then throws it down uh, to the other side. New Richmond gets a layup. They win by two because the game's over. He was going to win the game on a free throw. The ball was going in. The New Richmond guy reaches in, grabs it out of the cylinder, launches it down, to a waiting New Richmond player who lays it in, New Richmond wins by two. And, and uh, yes, an amazing play. Pretty, pretty impressive. But, but the, the Somerset coach is freaking out, like, wait a minute, you can't do that. And the Richmond guy's like, well, why not? I think we can do that. So the first question is, can a New Richmond player violate the lane thing, goaltend, and throw the ball, uh, which is an impressive play, but can you do that? That's one question. But remember, there were no refs there. So what's the second question? Is it constitutional? 
Rule. That's it. Who are we asking? The refs aren't there. The Somerset coach is saying no. This the Richmond coach is saying, well, I, I, I didn't see it. Who are they asking? And then I happen to be there. I'm in the crowd. So I stand and the the crowd parts like I'm Moses. And I walk down and say, I shall answer this question. No. And the Somerset crowd goes wild and they run off because it was for the conference title. And the Richmond people are like, who is that guy? Who, why is he the one answering? That's a good question. <laughs> you followed the metaphor, right? Yeah, you were able to follow the metaphor. Oh, are Who the is the guy board? emerging from the crowd? Board. That's it. That's it. Board, right? So he had this situation. <laughs> the current president says, you must honor this list. The next president says, no, I don't. So the first question is, does the next president have to honor the list? But the second question is, who are we asking? And the Supreme Court comes down like Moses. We shall answer this question. And everyone's looking at like, who? What? Because, because remember, all we've said about the Supreme Court is they ha handle appeals of appeals. And now the Supreme Court is giving itself a new responsibility. We shall answer questions of constitutionality. When one branch says A and another branch says B, it's the judicial branch that shall emerge like Moses and say, we've got it. We'll answer the question. The answer to the question is secondary. The most important thing to emerge from this Supreme Court decision is the idea that the Supreme Court would be the thing that answers the question. Good. Okay. So before I answer that question, let's acknowledge something. When the Supreme Court gave itself this new responsibility, is this an increase in federal government power? Is this an increase in judicial power? Yes. yes. The Supreme Court is increasing its authority on its own. We shall answer this question, and as a result, future questions like this. And then, so, so the Supreme Court has given itself more authority. And what's interesting is the answer to the, the, the other question is this. We do not have the authority to tell Jefferson to honor the previous list. Now, is that an increase or a decrease in judicial? It's a decrease. So you understand that this Supreme Court decision, at the same time, increased the Supreme Court's authority and decreased the Supreme Court's authority. It would answer questions, but in this case, it said, we do not have the authority to tell Jefferson to honor the list that Adams made. Does anyone know? What that authority to answer constitutional questions, what is that called? It was in your Kia. Or it will be in your next Kia. No. I think it was in your Kia. It is called judicial review. Judicial review. So just a couple things to note here. You have the Judiciary Act. It says the president is the entity that names judges. Adams makes a list. Madison refuses to honor the list. Madison is speaking on behalf of the next president, Jefferson. Does the next president have to honor the list that was made by the current president? Does he have to honor it? So they go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, we'll answer this question. The chief justice was John Marshall. He replaced John Jay. I don't know if John Jay died or I, don't, I, don't, I honestly don't know. John Marshall was the new chief justice of the Supreme Court. John Marshall is largely responsible for an invented 
power. Good luck finding it in the Constitution. It's not in there. The whole idea called judicial review. If you want a definition, it goes something like this. The Supreme Court would decide the constitutionality of difficult questions. What did the court say? The court said it did not have the authority to force Jefferson to honor the wishes of John Adams. So there's two questions answered here. One, who gets to answer the question? And two, what was the answer? Now, in red, don't you don't have to write this down, but it didn't have to be this way. Because the answer to the first question down here, who gets to interpret the Constitution? Jefferson would have said, well, states get to answer that. States get to decide what federal uh, actions are constitutional or not. Each state on its own gets to decide the idea of states' rights. Hamilton would have said, no, it's the federal government that gets to decide the constitutionality. Right, second bullet. In Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, Jefferson argued that states get to do this. And now there's another argument from John Marshall saying, well, actually, it's the Supreme Court that gets to decide. So apply that to today. Hey, is it constitutional to smoke marijuana? Who gets to answer that question? Well, liberal arguments would say it's the federal government. Otto would say, well, actually, we states get to make that decision. So the, the battle continues over this, this big idea. The end. Any questions? OK, I have something to hand out to you. Please just look at this side. Do not look at the side that has like two columns. Just the paragraph, please. This is an intro. This is a sample intro paragraph. I urge you to look at this and use it when you're writing the intro paragraph to your Lexington paper. Oh, shoot, I did it wrong. You know, a pencil or a pen or a marker or something? I want you for the U.S. Army. I want you to mark this paragraph up independently. Don't be afraid to be wrong. I've got more copies if you're wrong. I want you to identify where's the hook, where's the roadmap, and where's the thesis on this one. Go. This bad boy right there, it's on the website. Hook roadmap thesis. There's only three parts. Hook roadmap thesis. Hook roadmap thesis. Three parts. Shouldn't take too long, so I'll give you one more minute. Can I have a new one? Thank you. Oh shoot, I did my colors opposite.
Yes. Yes? Okay. Ten seconds. I have no fear of being wrong. Okay. So allow me to read sentence by sentence. You tell me what's going on here. In other words, just say hook, roadmap, pieces. Which team is superior, the Vikings or Packers? It's part of a hook, right? Dead giveaway for a hook. Is there a question involved? Okay. In order to determine the most likely answer, one must look at three factors. I think that's roadmap, hook, neither, transition. Yeah. Okay. Now, as we're doing this, I want you to think about how this could be translated into your first paragraph for your Lexington and Concord paper. Instead of it saying, which team is superior, the Vikings or Packers, who shot first, who shot first between the colonists and the uh, uh, British? Okay. In order to determine the most likely answer, one must look at three factors. Well, that's true for your Lexington and Concord paper, too. You're looking at three factors. Now, if you're wondering what three factors, look at the factors. You pick three. There were five options. You picked the three that you would like to talk about in your paper. If you know what those three are, go ahead and circle. That's fine. But let's keep going. The first factor is quality of facilities. The headquarters, practice locations, and stadiums of these teams goes a long way in determining which team can claim dominance over the other. Okay, Those two senses sort of work together. So you'll notice that each factor has two sentences. The first sentence introduces the factor. The second one kind of lists specifics about the factor. The first factor is quality of facilities. What does that mean? Well, the headquarters, practice location, stadium, those are things that are part for number one factor. By the way, what are these two senses? Roadmap, it's roadmap. The second factor is fan support. There's your, there's your one sentence. The next sentence will kind of explain what that means. The number of people who buy team gear, watch games on media, and attend games can help determine the public image of each team. You'll notice two sentences it takes to explain one of the factors. The first sentence simply introduces the factor. The second one sort of breaks it down. Third factor, the final factor is team success. There it is. It's a sentence introducing the third factor. Head-to-head -head games, regular season games, Playoff victories and Super Bowl championships can determine the success of one team versus the other. Again, it takes two sentences to explain one factor. The first sentence simply introduces the factor. The second sentence kind of breaks it down. Think about how you would take your three factors and write your roadmap. Now, I will say this. There are people in here that are really good writers. You don't have to write it this way. I'm simply presenting a way. This is for those of you who are stuck. And then, all right, you crack your knuckles, and here we go. You suddenly discover you're kind of hungry. So you go and make... All right. Okay. Up until the word other, up until and through the word other, do you have any idea what I have rendered as the superior team? No. 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 There's, there's no judgment yet. I'm simply introducing this is a factor, and this is a factor, and this is a factor. Finally, last sentence is because of superior facilities, fan support, and on-the-field success that the Green Bay Packers can lay claim to being a superior team over the Minnesota Vikings. I have finally rendered judgment. Okay? Now, I want you to notice something else. Am I saying in the thesis that the Packers are, in fact, the superior team? No, no I'm not. I'm saying because of these factors, the Packers can claim 
they are the superior team. Because I, I, I hope I've gotten this through your thick skulls by now. But we don't know who shot first. We don't know. We don't know if Columbus was someone to be admired or despised. All we can do is look at the evidence and suggest that the evidence points to Columbus being one or the other. All we can do is look at the evidence and say it points to the Packers or Vikings being the superior team. All we can do is say that the evidence points to the British or the Americans firing first. Yeah. What's your question? Why is that? Why is what? Oh. Okay, flip to the other side. The two column list. Circle your three. If you don't know them by now, good God. You should know which three. And I, I caution you, if one of the three that you circled points to the side firing first that you disagree with, why did you pick that one? <laughs> pick three that make it a clean sweep. Right? And then the right-hand column is the steps necessary. What's your hook? Do you introduce each idea, each of these ideas, there's three, in a sentence, and then do you have a clarifying sentence for each of the three? If you don't know what I mean, reread this. Each factor has two sentences. Each of these can have two sentences. One to state that it is a factor, and a second one to kind of clarify it. Again, you don't have to do it this way. This is a way. Any questions? There are a few minutes left. What? What? Those of you who were not here yesterday, you need to find yourself on one of the teams. So with the time remaining, will you please go where you belong? Jefferson, teams one, two, and three. Hamilton, teams one, two, and three. If you're neither, stand up here. And we need to get you to where you belong. Go! Whoa. I think we can be done with this. We have to 50, right? 50.